Welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, on behalf of the Middle East Task Force here in Al Jazeera English, I'm excited to welcome you to an exclusive screening of Fault Lines, uh, where we have Seb Walker and Jeremy Young, who just returned from Bahrain recently. They also did an episode in Libya, asking why has the US intervened differently in different countries, and you know what is the trajectory of American policy uh, in the Gulf and beyond. So, we're joined by Shana Betterblau from the Solidarity Center, the Middle East director who will comment on the film, and she spent a lot of time in the region. So I'm going to quickly turn to Jeremy, who's a senior producer with Al Jazeera English, to do a little introduction for this documentary, and we'll get things started. So thanks so much for joining us. Cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming out. Uh, as Jonathan explained, I'm a producer at Al Jazeera English here in Washington, D.C. Um, it's been a, a monumental year so far for our channel. Uh, we just announced last week that we launched on Time Warner Cable in New York City, uh, Channel 92, so that's really good for us getting more exposure here in the U.S. Uh, but just broadly, I think the Arab Spring has really thrusted uh, Al Jazeera English into the forefront. Uh, people all around the world have really looked to the network uh, for their coverage of events of the region uh, to understand sort of what these changes are about and what's going on. Uh, so the program that we work for, Fault Lines, is based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we cover largely U.S. issues and U.S. interests around the globe. Uh, so we sort of put our heads together to figure out how we were going to contribute to the network's coverage of what was going on in the region. So we sort of set out with a two-pronged approach uh, to do uh, two half-hour documentaries. Uh, as Jonathan was saying, the first one we did looked at Libya. Uh, and the U.S. decision to intervene uh, militarily in Libya and, and why that decision was made and how it was made. And then to sort of contrast that, we looked at uh, the situation in Bahrain and the Gulf and to look at sort of what uh, U.S. interests are there and to sort of uh, dissect uh, what U.S. policy has been to the Gulf in the wake of the Arab Spring. So that was sort of the, the focus of those two programs. Tonight we're going to watch the, the second one um, and then hopefully we'll have a, a stimulating conversation and discourse afterwards. Uh, but thanks a lot for, for taking time out to come, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and your comments. Uh, also, I know our executive producer, Matt Skeen, is somewhere here in the crowd, and uh, Sweta Vora, who is our associate producer on this project, was here. Uh, our editor, uh, Warwick Mead, and our cameraman, Ben Foley, also deserve a lot of credit for this project. They're not here. They might be watching online. I don't know. but. Um, Thanks a lot for coming. I look forward to hearing your guys' thoughts and, and your guys' perspective on our work. Thanks. NYMEX, the New York Mercantile Exchange, the largest oil trading market in the world. Chef 101, 105 call spread, 102.90. Billions of dollars of oil and gas contracts pass across these screens. 99.03. me. Energy that's vital to the survival of the U.S. economy. And it's these traders who are buying and selling those contracts based on what the future price of oil might get to. It's essentially one huge betting game, largely controlled by investment banks and hedge funds. When protests flared across the Arab world earlier this year, investors here became deeply concerned. You had Bahrain, you had Saudi Arabia, and these protesters were starting to spread and things like that. And we looked at this and said, wait a minute, this could be very bad. No, no. Stabilizing the oil markets has been a central tenet of U.S. foreign policy for decades. It's often meant empowering dictators in oil-producing countries at the expense of supporting democratic ideals. But the Arab Spring has brought about change nobody expected, including the Obama administration. While the U.S. has become engaged in civil war in North Africa, its approach towards the oil-rich Gulf has been very different. That's terrible. That's terrible. What are we going to do, as I said? We're going to stop buying their oil? That's inconceivable. We need it for the functioning of our economy. Bahrain is a country where foreign journalists have been banned. Fault Lines has come here at the invitation of the US military, which has its Middle East Navy headquarters in this tiny Gulf state. We're also here for another reason, 
to secretly meet those who've been protesting and calling for democracy and find out how they feel about the lack of US intervention here. Um, we've been speaking to people who've been reporting here recently over the past few weeks, saying that you know they've been moving hotels four times in any given week, trying to escape the eye of authorities who are really cracking down on media coverage of the events here. So we really don't know what to expect. It's um, a, a very strange situation that we're in. The Arab Spring came to Bahrain on February the 14th when protesters took to the streets calling for economic reform and political equality for the country's majority Shia community. Labelled as agents of Iran by the government, Bahraini security forces opened fire days later on the crowds at the Pearl Roundabout. The United Nations called the response shocking and blatant violations of international law. More than 30 people have been killed and hundreds injured since the protests began. From their work and targeted in their living, thousands of people are prisoners for every thousand citizens today. All of them, or most of them, were systematically tortured, electrocuted, sexually harassed, sexually assaulted, hanged. Nabil Rajab is one of the few human rights activists here willing to show his face on camera. We have thousands of similar cases. Really? Nabil gives counselling and advice to families caught in the violence. He told us that given the strong US military presence in Bahrain, one of the questions they most often ask is why the US hasn't done more. The silence of the United States have disappointed people very much. Uh, it is very much clear now to the United States is a democracy and a human right should be applied only in those countries where the United States have a problem with, but not with those dictatorship they have a good relation with. And we see that very clearly. And that Nabil's house is under constant surveillance. We're taking what precautions we can to get our material out safely and protect the identities of those who don't want their faces shown. Protesters that have spoken with Al Jazeera before have been beaten, arrested or gone missing. But some are still willing to speak out. If every person kept silence, then the external world will not know our, our problem. Then we have to blame ourselves for being silent. Sayyid Youssef was a teacher. He was fired after taking part in the protests at the Pearl Roundabout. Like Nabil, he's disappointed by America's response. After the visit of Secretary of Defense to Bahrain, they have attacked the, the roundabout after one day. And after the visit of the Deputy of Secretary of Foreign Affairs, they have, they have a store in Widrad village. And after every visit, especially this uh, Jeffrey Feltman, he, his reputation is very bad here. People are talking about him badly. The king and the crown prince have outlined a vision for Bahrain by which the moderate voices would work together to chart a positive path forward. And that's what, that's what we want to see. We've Ambassador Jeffrey Feltman is the lead official for the U.S. State Department handling all Middle East affairs. He's visited Bahrain eight times since February. These protesters know you by name. They, 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 they know that you visited the country several times. I mean, what they ask is that the U.S. speaks out and condemns what's going on there in stronger terms. But again, I, I, I would just go back to what I said. It may not be satisfactory to those who wish that we would beat our chests and jump and run, you know, um, and sort of issue lots of lots of statements. You know, we need to look at how is best to promote our policies in any country in the world, depending on the relationship we have with that country, depending on the other strategic interests we have in that country. One strategic interest the U.S. has in Bahrain is the presence of the Fifth Fleet, America's most important naval base. From their headquarters in Manama, the fleet covers nearly 7 million square kilometers of maritime territory, but most importantly, the vital shipping lanes for Middle East oil. All civilized people benefit from this free flow of goods and services. So a vast majority of the world's energy comes out of this region which is one of the reasons it's such an important region for everybody. Less than 250 kilometers from the coast of Iran, the island of Bahrain is ruled by a Sunni royal family 
the Al Khalifas. Their rule is backed by their powerful Sunni neighbor and America's strongest ally in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia. I think the calculations of Bahrain are much more complex and difficult for us because number one, uh, our fifth fleet is stationed there. Number two, Bahrain of course is important to Saudi Arabia, one of our major partners in the Arab world. And number three, no one wants to see Iran, uh, which is a government that we despise, um, profit from these changes in the Arab world. I think all those calculations have led the United States government to be much more cautious. On the 14th of March, after nearly a month of protests, Saudi Arabia dispatched a military force of a thousand troops to help put down the protests in Bahrain. U.S. officials have said they were not informed the Saudis were heading across the border, even though U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates met with the Bahraini ruling family just days before. You think they told the U.S. they were sending Saudi troops into Bahrain? No, they just did it. They did not consult us. They considered it their business, not ours. They've, they've lost faith, perhaps, in the, they, the U.S. support for that. Because they thought we ran away from Mubarak. Saudi Arabia's decision to send a thousand troops along this causeway into Bahrain was widely seen here as an attempt to counter the perceived threat of Iran. They were there to crush the protests, but many feel that this was a shot across the bow for Tehran. No one from Bahrain's government would speak to us about the crackdown. But there are people here who think it was justified. Adel Maimoun is a Sunni businessman. OK, here in Bahrain, when you see you're uh, protesting of, you, because of your poor living uh, situation, come on, that's a joke. <laughs> it cannot be. My office boy has three mobiles. OK, and uh, later on, the evidence uh, it showed up about an Iran, uh, Iran's involvement. And of course, uh, Hezbollah from Lebanon, which is backed uh, by Iran. The characterization of the protests as a regional power grab by Iran is made by US officials too. It stems from sectarian dynamics in this Sunni-ruled country, where roughly two thirds of the population is Shia. The reports of the destruction of uh, Shia mosques in some villages and this being part of the crackdown, I mean, do you think that's, that's true? And if I so, can, do you, do you I think can, it's I can, I can say you one thing. I'm a Bahraini. Mm -hmm. I'm living in Bahrain. And during the, the previous uh, period, the, from the start of uh, the protests and everything, I have never left the country. There is no single Shia mosque which has been demolished. But we'd heard differently, that in villages north of Bahrain's capital, it was possible to see evidence of the destruction. Okay, and no, just, just down, yeah, don't worry. With police checkpoints everywhere, it was difficult to film without getting caught. We tried to find a way around the checkpoints that we've just seen, blocking the entrance to the village of Naladrat, which was raided just a couple of days ago. After a detour, we managed to reach a pre-arranged meeting point with a contact in the protest movement. Okay, I have a number. Uh, we have a big white SUV behind a mosque. We'll, uh, we'll, yeah. That's Adwera. That's mosque. Here, here, here. Yeah. On that, uh, it's, it's they are destroyed. Clearly the remains of a destroyed mosque, there are religious books lying amongst the rubble. It was destroyed by JCB diggers in the past few weeks during the crackdown, and apparently this is going on all over Bahrain. Yeah, down, down there. We're told that we have to move on very quickly because there are people watching yes, these yes. areas. Yes. But if we hang around too long, the police are going to turn up. After showing us more destroyed buildings, our contact took us to meet a man whose two brothers had recently been taken away by the police. We don't know, this is the problem, we don't know what is the situation. Whether he's alive or not, we don't know. We cannot, we cannot go to ask about him, because if, you go, if we go there, they will catch us also. 
Everybody's in the same situation. All of us, all of us, all of us, all of the climate of fear is palpable here. And once again, there's disbelief that the US isn't doing more. I mean, the US, I mean, the people, I'm sure they are with us. They are trying to help us, the people. But the government, I don't know why. Maybe because they have the fifth uh, base here. I don't know the base. Are you concerned by the reports of human rights abuses that have gone on since the protests began in February? You know, I'm, I'm focused on what goes on in the water and uh, in the maritime domain. So that doesn't affect your presence here or, or your, your position? That, that's not something that... We have uh, a long-standing relationship with the Kingdom of Bahrain, and they are a very solid partner. But is there any level of um, human rights abuse that could affect the position of the U.S. military here? I mean, if... The, if the Kingdom of Bahrain is a long-standing partner and we are very uh, committed to the relationship, and uh, they're an important part. We've been here for 60 years. Stepping onto the deck of the USS Ronald Reagan is like getting a front row seat to US military strategy in the Middle East. We're just off the coast of Iran on a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier packed with the latest military hardware. There are more than 5,000 US servicemen and women on board. It costs a million dollars a day to operate this ship. The US Navy now keeps two carriers in the region at all times. There are dozens of aircraft on this carrier. Most of them are fighter jets like this, running operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and throughout the Middle East. And the sense that people have here is that not only is this a mission to support allies of the US throughout the region by reassuring them there is a solid military footprint here, but also as a stern reminder to adversaries of the US also that the US military isn't far away. Just our presence alone out here. You know, us, you know, having our, our military uh, ground forces, having our air support and everything sends a very strong message to, you know, the enemy over there saying that we are here and we are ready to strike and support our ground troops, you know, if necessary, so very big role. Uh, it's about 44 nautical miles to Iran. From where we are there? Right, from where we are right now. Okay. The bridge of the ship is where potential threats to the shipping lanes are monitored. Sailors here are constantly on the lookout. There's uh, tankers, there's cargo vessels, there's dows, uh, lots of vessels out there. A uh, very vital area of the world that uh, plenty of folks are using it for plenty of different purposes. The ship's stated mission is using air support to protect US troops on the ground. But it's also here to protect the US economy by keeping energy flowing through the Straits of Hormuz. This is a particularly challenging stretch of water to navigate. Not only is it one of the busiest oil export channels in the world, but on one side you have the coast of Iran and less than 150 nautical miles away, the coast of Saudi Arabia. In the middle, the USS Ronald Reagan acting as a buffer. Two regional superpowers one a U.S. ally, the other a sworn enemy of Washington, with billions of dollars of oil shipments flowing in between. The USS Ronald Reagan is almost like an insurance policy for the energy markets. To withdraw from that space, uh, particularly if it were precipitously, would, would, would be a real game changer. Given the turmoil in the region, I think it settles things down and reduces the risks of open military conflict between nations. It would be more important than the United States one day withdrawing from Iraq or Afghanistan. This, is, this, this would be a very big deal indeed for, for the oil markets. You think it sends a message to have that kind of militarized presence? Yeah, I think, I think it does. I think everybody takes note of it. And they realize that they couldn't take military action without first thinking about and fearing the consequences. And I think that's good. Demonstrations in the Gulf haven't been confined to Bahrain. People have taken to the streets in Iraq, Oman, Kuwait. 
and in early March in eastern Saudi Arabia, where the majority of the country's oil reserves are located. In and around the city of Katif, protesters marched demanding democratic reforms. As in Bahrain, they were mainly from the Shia community, a minority in Saudi Arabia. Also, as in Bahrain, security forces opened fire on crowds. King Abdullah, now 87 years old, has responded with the carrot as well as the stick, simultaneously launching a $100 billion spending program as well as a brutal crackdown. I think, though, Saudi Arabia itself faces a choice in terms of reform or trying to clamp down on any dissent. I think those, that's a very stark choice it has. If they pursue a more security-led approach, is what we've seen in Bahrain right now and what we've seen um, in parts of the kingdom, I fear that the response uh, may well then be something which is more sinister for the Saudi leadership. The Saudi government denied fault lines permission to enter the country. So we tried to meet some of those who've been protesting outside Saudi's borders. The borders between these Gulf countries are often right in the middle of the desert. There's often no real delineation between one country and the next. We're right now headed to the frontier with Saudi Arabia. Over these dunes, we've arranged to speak with some Saudi Arabian dissidents about the situation in that country. On this occasion, they weren't able to cross the border, saying it was too dangerous. So we rigged up a satellite to speak to them over the internet. How big are these protests? Every village, maybe they, they can reach three to 400 people. But once it was the biggest one during the protests, it was after uh, the Saudi army get to the Bahrain, it reached 5,000 people in Al Qatif. And I know there is so many people who want to go out and want, want to shout for their rights, but they can't. Mm. Even they are afraid or they can't, they can't uh, guess what the Saudi government will do for them. Do you feel that the authorities um, are, are watching and are, are, are trying to, to um, resist any, any spreading of this protest? They always feel dangerous from the Shia. They, they are always afraid that we are just as soldiers of Iran. We are not. You know, the interdynamics of the country is changing. Um, there are difficulties. Uh, the government really failed to uh, redress these uh, difficulties. For instance, unemployment, poverty, alienation of different groups. What, what are you calling for? What's your ultimate uh, objective? Uh, if, if people could have a voice and a choice to elect their officials, their representative, that could scrutinize the government, could limit the authority of the royal family, uh, this is our ultimate goal. But that goal still seems far off. People we spoke with didn't anticipate any real reform soon. And for the US, support for the House of Saud means a counterweight to Iran, clamping down on funding for Al-Qaeda and maintaining a free flow of oil. Those are real interests. You can't disregard them. You can't just sweep them aside and say they don't mean anything. I think in the real world, as governments make decisions, governments will balance these interests. And sometimes the balance will be in favor of the geopolitical interests, and sometimes the balance will be in favor of the political or democratic interests. Right now, there's nothing to say about Saudi Arabia, uh, and it's really unclear what, what's going to happen. What I what I think is important is that Saudi Arabia not become the center of a counter-revolution. I think that doesn't serve Saudi's interests, and it certainly doesn't serve the interests uh, of the region. So it is with great confidence and faith in our future that I welcome the President of the United States, Barack Obama. When Barack Obama made his speech in May outlining the U.S. position on the historic changes in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia didn't even get a mention. But he did mention Bahrain. Nevertheless, we have insisted both publicly and privately that mass arrests and brute force are at odds with the universal rights of Bahrain citizens. On our last night in Manama, we watched the speech with a member of the largest opposition party in Bahrain. 
Al-Wafak has had two of its members in prison since the crackdown. It's recently pulled out of talks with Bahrain's rulers, saying they're not serious about reform. I believe that the uh, American, they have, like all other people, they don't want to uh, anger their friends uh, or their closest regime. For Syed, and for many people living in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia who've taken huge risks by taking to the streets, the issue is that President Obama's words have been selective, supporting protester-led uprisings in some parts of the Arab world, but not others. In Cairo, we heard the voice of the young mother who said, it's like I can finally breathe fresh air for the first time. The United States foreign policy and national security interests are well, they're dictated by precisely that, our national interests. So a lot of these remain consistent uh, over time. In Sana, we heard the students who chanted, the night must come to an end. For the last 50 years, there's been, you know, an unspoken, unholy alliance between us and the Arab autocrats. They sell us oil at too high a price, and we provide them with arms. That can't be the deal into the future. In Benghazi, we heard the engineer who said, our words are free now. It's a feeling you can't explain. In some countries, you've seen the United States stand up very clearly for values and for human rights and for democracy. In other instances, we've seen the United States act to protect, in essence, and defend the status quo. In Damascus, we heard the young man who said, after the first yelling, the first shout, you feel dignity. In Bahrain, we heard the protesters who had the courage to call for change. It's a call that's being silenced while America watches on, mindful of its interests in this part of the Middle East. Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, once again, I'm Jonathan Geyer with the Middle East Task Force here at the New America Foundation. Uh, we aim to bring new perspectives to long-standing conflicts in the region, and uh, we focus a lot on Israel-Palestine, but something like Bahrain is just uh, so immensely important that uh, I'm really excited that we're having this conversation today. Uh, this is, uh, sitting with me is Sebastian Walker, who's uh, the correspondent for Al Jazeera's Fault Lines, their sort of premier documentary program. Uh, airs weekly, and uh, we have Shana Bader-Blau, who's the Middle East Director for the Solidarity Center. If you're not familiar with the Solidarity Center, they advocate for international labor rights, uh, standards, uh, they're affiliated with the AFL-CIO, and she's spent a considerable time, uh, the last 13 years, back and forth from the region. So uh, we'll hear her perspective on where labor unions, and um, in case you don't know, Bahrain has a really rich history of a robust labor unionization movements, uh, one of the most interesting in the, in the region and definitely in the Gulf. And then we have, uh, we're joined by Jeremy Young, who is a senior producer for Al Jazeera. Uh, he's been with uh, NBC and CNN, so uh, we'll also hear what it's like to be reporting from a country like Bahrain where they have kicked out uh, a great deal about, of the foreign reporters. So um, just to start, I think one of the most interesting things about this film is that it really tackles head on the, uh, the USS Ronald Reagan, the Fifth Fleet, the US presence, military presence, in addition to other presences the US has in the Gulf, but the naval presence in particular. Now, I, this is something I've been fascinated by because when all of these protests started in the region, obviously, um, Bahrain was not the headline maker. And what's fascinating is that, is it because of our US naval base there or not? Now, in the last, uh, 40 years, our presence there has increased tenfold. We initially had a 10-acre small naval base there. Now it's 100 acres. We have put huge investments in the last five years, hundreds of millions of dollars into this base, making it seem unrealistic to the military establishment to relocate it. But I just think it's a question that hasn't been asked. So I'm really excited to ask these questions. Uh, Sebastian, tell us about what it was like to be on that uh, the USS Ronald Reagan, what was the response of people who didn't make it on film of what the US could be doing, what kind of leverage we can bring to bear uh, in Bahrain? 
Well, it's interesting. I think some of these questions are now being asked as people find out the extent of the human rights situation in Bahrain. Um, we had the opportunity to go right to the heart of this, and obviously um, on the USS Ronald Reagan, we were speaking with the soldiers and sailors on the ship um, about how they felt being at what is essentially the, the center of US policy in the region. This is um, such a critical channel of water, and the oil exports through the Straits of Hormuz really um, are vital to the US economy. This, this was the starting point of the film. You saw us start off at the NYMEX uh, trading floor we thought that was the best place to start a film about what US policy is all about in the Gulf. Um, and, and so going to uh, the Gulf and speaking to the people in the military there about how the events in Bahrain were affecting their position and what they thought about what the future might hold with you know, signs of uh, unrest even spreading to Saudi Arabia it was very interesting indeed, and especially my conversation with the vice admiral that you saw in the film. I mean, there was no question in his mind that this was, not, um, some, uh, that this was something which was ever going to really affect um, the position of the US military. The relationship they have with Bahrain is such a crucial one and such a long-standing one that there was really no discussion about whether this, the position of the US uh, Fifth Fleet in Bahrain was ever going to be affected, no matter what the extent of the human rights abuses in that country. Um, there has been some discussion in the media. We've seen articles since our visit there um, with some uh, officials from within the military establishment um, you know, asking a question about whether there is a, a potential alternative, whether um, the U.S. Fifth Fleet could be moved to another country. But it's also emerged that the deal that the U.S. has signed with the Bahraini authorities is actually going to extend um, into 2016, I believe. Um, so this is a strategic partnership that the U.S. is firmly um, tied into. And uh, I think all of the events that we're seeing going on in the Middle East right now uh, are, are really challenging some of these long-standing relationships. And the point of the film was to really get to the heart of uh, what difficulties the U.S. is going to face now and what the future policy uh, should be when they're trying to balance national interests with these uh, um, uh, pro-democracy protests going on all around the region. Um, so it was, it was a, a, an incredibly interesting project for me. I mean, it was one of the most um, interesting shoots I've ever been on. And to have the opportunity to also um, get on the ground in Bahrain at a time when there were no other foreign journalists there um, was extremely interesting too. And um, the reaction and the response that we had from protesters that we were speaking to um, was, was very positive. People were just very glad that we were there and doing this story. And I think that the, um, uh, the big questions about US foreign policy that result um, from a discussion of the situation specifically with regard to Bahrain, um, I think are going to be asked for uh, some weeks and months to come. Thank you. So um, I want to turn to Shauna to sort of give your respondents sort of what, what are your impressions of the film? You were just in Bahrain in May meeting with uh, labor union uh, leaders who, were, who you know, played a crucial role in the protest movement there. Yeah, I would say that I think that from uh, my perspective of having spent that time there at around the same time you were there, I think um, the film captures really in a, in a very strong way the um, incredible climate of fear that existed. Um, I know when, when we were there, the people uh, we talked to in many occasions talked in hushed tones like you represented. Uh, careful about their names being made public and the things they were saying being made public. Um, while we were there, the, um, the situation with uh, working people in the country, um, pr primarily in the major state-owned enterprises, was that many hundreds of them were being dismissed, fired from their jobs for having participated in peaceful protests. And in fact, while I was there, I spoke with a number, a couple dozen of workers um, who had lost their jobs after being interrogated by their human resources department about things like, did you go to Pearl Roundabout? When did you go to Pearl Roundabout? And often people were being fired from their jobs even though they demonstrated outside of working time. The impression was one of incredible sense of um, retaliation against the peaceful protest movement getting started just then, and it's something that has continued to this day um, with more and more employees in both the public sector and the private sector being fired for having participated in peaceful protests all the way through July. And so, you know, one thing I wanted to ask, I mean, your impression while you were there of the hopes that people had for the future, I mean, this was fundamentally a pro-democracy movement mm. that, as you point out, was pretty much silenced um, in many ways. 
given the incredible interests of the US and Saudi Arabia in Bahrain, what is your sense of the prospects for this pro-democracy movement really achieving democratic gains in the country? Well, we were only there for a relatively short period of time, but we did meet several um, members of the protest movement. Some of them didn't make the film, but we, um, as you say, the climate of, of fear there was definitely um, some, something which I hadn't even expected, that the extent to which people were scared was something that um, I wasn't really prepared for, and it was very difficult getting access to speak to anybody. Um, there were the, the scene that you saw where we were, we were kind of creeping around, going to people's apartments. There, there were police checkpoints probably about 200 meters away from where, where that person was speaking to us. Um, there were police all over these villages um, outside Manama where um, there, um, some of the protest movements ha have been gathering. Um, and I just actually spoke to Nabil, um, the man that you saw interviewed from the Human Rights Center a little earlier today, asking him what the situation's like there now. And he's saying that, um, as, as you say, I mean, the extent of the crackdown has really um, surprised people in the protest movement, and it's, it's, it's made the situation incredibly difficult. But there are protests still continuing. He's saying that um, in the villages out, outside Manama nightly, there are, um, there are people organizing, there are police also, um, uh, making arrests using tear gas. This is a situation that is continuing. So although they have been um, met by a very severe crackdown, there are statistics um, which are highlighted very well in another Al Jazeera film, Shouting in the Dark, which has um, just been released as well, which really charts the whole um, process of um, the movement from start to finish. Um, but in terms of the prospects for its success, I think um, f my impression from speaking to members of that movement was that there had really been a kind of sea change in the way that they um, feel about um, the, the um, calls for some kind of democratic change in Bahrain. People had um, gathered in um, Pearl Roundabout and the extent of the mobilization there was, was such that people really feel that thi things have gone over the edge and that there's no um, going back from it. People um, that we were speaking to were saying that this is not going to go away. Whatever the extent of the crackdown, they will be continuing to protest. And, for me, I think the, um, I, I mean, the dynamics of the um, demographics there and the, the kind of nature of these protests is, is such that it, this, this is not going to go away. There is, there, there is a huge inequality in Bahrain. It's, it's often along sectarian lines. And I think it's a problem that's not going to be fixed, um, no matter what the um, actions of the security services and the government, unless there is real um, political change. So that, that was my impression of speaking to the, the members of the movement there. So Shauna, let me ask you, um, in terms of the leverage that the U.S. can bring to bear in Bahrain, um, in addition to the military component, is the economic and financial aspect of it. And Bahrain's one of the, I think, four Arab countries that the U.S. has a free trade agreement with, um, which is interesting because, whatever, why does the U.S. have a free trade agreement in this case? Um, one, one of the, I think, really important things the AFL-CIO has been doing since, uh, since the Bahraini Spring, so to speak, has been to call on the U.S. Trade Representative to review this free trade agreement, to say that, uh, to ask whether Bahrain has indeed been in violation of it. And in um, the AFL-CIO's report and Human Rights Watch reports on this, basically say uh, Bahrain, the regime there has made a mockery of the free trade agreement by not allowing workers to go back to their uh, former employment. So could you tell us about um, your experience? Uh, you know, what, what is the regime saying on this? I, a couple of weeks ago, I met with the, um, the Bahraini Minister of Labor and the Minister of Industry were in town sort of running uh, w whatever they could do to quiet down this free trade agreement issue because they don't want, uh, you know, the background noise that it causes. So. Certainly. So, um, you know, one of the, the many um, very interesting things about um, Bahrain, which is a really um, deep, rich, and diverse uh, country um, and a wonderful place to visit, um, the, is, is the historical importance of the, the trade union movement. This is a movement that is a non-sectarian movement. It is a multi-partisan movement. It does not represent one party or the other. It doesn't place itself officially in the opposition or pro-government, but rather as a representative of working people in the country um, in, all their, in all their diversity. And a very strong voice for the, um, 
the poor working classes in Bahrain of Bahraini citizens that the um, fellow from the business community in your video um, in fact mocked. Um, they have been advocating for their rights to better wages and working conditions um, for a very long time, decades underground when they were illegal and since they were made um, legal just at an early part of 2001-2002, um, um, more vocally and, 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 um, and trying to advocate for public policy positions that would strengthen the voice of workers and strengthen the Bahraini uh, working people and help build a middle class. Um, and so I think that, you know, for international labor movement, unions all over the world really looked, in fact, to Bahrain as a place where you had a labor movement unique in the Gulf, in a place not known for um, a whole lot of democracy um, when you look at the big neighbors like Saudi Arabia and Oman and Qatar and, and in the region. But here was a labor movement that was modeling really strong democratic practices and really representational. They represented approximately 25,000 um, workers in the country out of a workforce of a couple hundred thousand only. So it's a, it's a small country. Um, so I think when the crackdown um, started on the peaceful protest movement in the country, the labor unions played a role. They were in Pearl Roundabout. They were there with the people. They were um, uh, issuing statements and trying to talk to the government about a way to move forward towards peaceful dialogue. And they were part of coalitions of civil society groups that were advocating for democracy, not an overthrow of the regime, not an overthrow of the uh, ruling family, not a change in the, the system of, uh, but they wanted a constitutional monarchy. And, and this is something the king has promised uh, already a decade ago made sort of pronouncements about even a timetable of how a constitutional monarchy was going to come about, and that just fell by the wayside. Yeah, and so they really saw themselves as, in fact, carrying forward the promises of the National Charter and other um, promises made you know, by the government of uh, Bahrain over time for reform and democratic transition. So when the crackdown started, um, what you saw was, you know, in the, over the course of the violence and the, and the um, repression and the arrests that took place, the labor movement coming out and standing up and saying this is wrong and speaking for average people. They organized um, in, in the harshest moments of the checkpoints and the presence of the Saudi troops in the country when they came, a general strike that rallied many thousands of Bahraini workers. And, as, and that was in, you know, in March. All of this is to say that at once that general strike was called off in consultation with the Bahraini business community who promised there would be no retaliation against workers who participated in strikes that were uh, on strike to protect their own lives through the danger of trying to get to work at all through the checkpoints and the violence. After promises from the government, the prime minister's office um, itself, that there would be no retaliation against workers, in fact, many hundreds were fired starting in April and continue to this day, as I mentioned before, to be fired and retaliated against in a very deep way for having done precisely that. And so I think um, in the midst of all that, the AFL-CIO, because of this trade agreement, um, filed this complaint under the trade agreement saying that the level of human rights abuses in the country rise to a level that is a beyond the pale and that the U.S. government should review this trade agreement. Um, and, you know, this is, um, you know, I'm, the AFL-CIO uh, website, if you're interested, has um, a lot of background uh, on this. Don't read the trade agreement. It's like a thousand pages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in the end, I think um, the Department of Labor, who is responsible for, um, for these things, in fact, accepted the agreement um, that the AFL-CIO uh, um, filed, the complaint, rather. They accepted the complaint, and that started a process. It's a bureaucratic process and a political process of engagement between the American government and the Bahraini government over whether or not the Bahraini <coughs> government is in fact in violation of its own labor laws in the dismissals, the discrimination against trade unionists. Um, many uh, 40 trade union elected, you know, freely democratically elected trade union representatives in the workplace have been fired. Um, and um, so the complaint alleges and calls for um, the review of the agreement in light of these conditions. And so that review is ongoing. 
Um, and, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, I think in the context of the questions you raised earlier, um, and your film uh, as well raises, about um, the U.S. and its position, this is one place where the U.S. government has an opportunity to, um, to speak up for fundamental human rights. And, um, you know, it's a first step in accepting the complaint, and I think we'll see how it goes. Thanks. So let's, let's quickly turn uh, to Jeremy. Just, I'm interested in hearing, before we're going to open to questions shortly, so don't worry. And to don't our friends yet. watching online, uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm really interested, fault lines goes everywhere. You've reported from all sorts of challenging circumstances. Yeah. What, what was it like sort of dodging police checkpoints, regime, followers, whatever sort of situation you're in in Bahrain? Yeah. So the, the circumstances for um, our trip there, the, the week before uh, we were set to arrive, the Reuters correspondent who had been there forever uh, was asked to leave Bahrain. Um, and so the only reason why we were permitted to enter the country at all was because we had set up this embark with uh, the US military. They put together a letter and sent it to the Bahraini government and said, you know, they're coming to visit our military base. Uh, and that was sort of our key for being able to get into the country. When we actually arrived there, uh, we were the only credentialed foreign journalists in the country. Uh, the other, other journalists who were there were there undercover or had entered as tourists uh, and weren't open stating that they were working on whatever they were working on. So we really were the only credentialed journalists that were there at the time. And, um, you know, we film, nowadays we shoot all of our stuff on uh, memory cards and we put our stuff onto hard drives. And so our approach, we really didn't know how much we'd be allowed to film and, and sort of what the circumstances would be like. So after our first uh, day and a half of filming, uh, we put all of our material onto one hard drive. I took it to the airport. I flew out of the country uh, and took our material out to a different country, dropped it off. Uh, and then flew back the next day to meet up with the team. Uh, and we repeated that process so that we could safely get our material out and then we could continue on with our reporting. If something had happened, if we had been arrested, uh, our material was safely out of the country at that point. Uh, Seb was picked up by uh, authorities on the causeway uh, when they were out there filming, uh, but he was uh, released and let go. Uh, and in the end, we were able to, I think, operate a lot more uh, with a lot more freedom than we had anticipated. I mean, people uh, that were working there before us were moving from hotel to hotel. Uh, people were sort of tracking every email and every phone call they sent. Uh, it was a really unclear atmosphere. I mean, even my, when I was coming back through uh, customs to enter the country after already having left it, you know, it's a very sort of tense atmosphere and they're like, you know, how long are you gonna be here in Bahrain? And I'm like, I'm just here for the day. And they're like, what are you doing here? And I was like, well, I'm here to meet somebody. And the guy kind of looking at me, kind of does, you know, like that, and I'm kind of like looking at him. And he goes, what country is the person that you're meeting from? I was like, the United States. And he like looked at my passport and flipped through my passport, and he looked up at me again. And he looked at my passport and flipped through it again, and he like looked at me and stamped my passport like while he was looking at me in the eye. And I was like, whew, and I, you know, we were able to get through and, and get our material back and forth. Um, but it was, you know, we really didn't know what to expect, and it was really challenging situation to operate in. I mean, we've, we operate in places that are dangerous, but I think this was a very different set of circumstances than we're used to. The one thing we wanted to really avoid was having people go through our material before we'd had a chance to edit it and blur out the faces of people who didn't want their faces shown. Um, our biggest concern was that we would be um, taken in and people would actually start to go through what we'd filmed and identify people who'd interviewed with us before we'd kind of made the necessary correction to hide their identity. Because um, in the past, Al Jazeera has interviewed people in Bahrain and those people have subsequently been arrested. Um, and um, and that be beaten and, and gone missing. I mean, they, Al Jazeera English did a program in the very early days of the protests and every person who they interviewed in that project were either uh, arrested, uh, tortured, beaten, their families were uh, intimidated, houses were trashed. Uh, so there were really serious consequences for, for speaking with media. Wow, well, we're really glad that you were uh, able to get all of your material out and gotten out safely so that you could share this really important story. So um, we're gonna turn, Dan, my colleague here, is gonna be handling the microphone. Um, we can start with this 
woman right in here in front. If you could just state uh, your affiliation and name and make it a question. Okay. Uh, my name is Rachel Oswald. I'm with Global Security Newswire. I really appreciated the documentary. And um, for Jeremy and Sebastian, um, I was, I guess, a little surprised at how thorough it was considering that Al Jazeera took some flack earlier in the revolutions for, for initially covering them and then backing down. And of course, the word was that Qatar had said no, 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 and then Qatar had subsequently supported Saudi Arabia in the, <coughs> in the forces entering Bahrain. So I'm wondering if, uh, knowing that Al Jazeera English enjoys more, um, I guess, editorial independence than Al Jazeera, is your ability to, to go do this documentary, does it reflect a realignment of Qatar's thinking that maybe it, it does want to support some democratic um, movement in Bahrain, regardless of Saudi Arabia's wants? No, it doesn't. I mean, we, we're a news organization. We operate separately to the political agenda of Qatar. It, this, this, this was a program that we thought it was necessary to make, mainly from the U.S. angle. I mean, this, this is a U.S.-focused show that we work on here in D.C., and we thought it was necessary to ask the kinds of questions that we hadn't seen being asked on U.S. networks. Uh, it's the first time that I've seen, um, you know, a kind of extensive... Um, look at what is behind the U.S. policy response to the Arab Spring. So that was really our, our, our motivation. I mean, I think for anyone who does um, have complaints about the level of coverage that we've given to Bahrain, this show um, really kind of answers a lot of those questions. There's another program we've just put out called Shouting in the Dark, which charts the entire course of the, um, uh, uh, the movement from, from start to finish. That's and, they, and Al Jazeera has gotten an incredible amount of flack for that program. Apparently, as recently as Sunday, uh, journalists weren't allowed into Bahrain because of the Shouting in the Dark program. And I mean, it's, it's quite a powerful film. I mean, because it's 50 minutes, you have a, an extra 25 minutes of intensity. But um, right. yeah, I mean, so, so certainly from, from the perspective of us working for the channel here, I mean, here I've worked in Doha as well. I've spent a lot of time um, in the Middle East. I was there to launch the channel um, and uh, spent a good two and a half years there. I mean, I've never had any um, uh, aspect of my work um, hindered by any political um, uh, uh, choices that Qatar makes. It's just not something that comes into our editorial thinking, so. Great, well, let's take another question. Um, this woman on the right, my right. Hi, Mara James, no affiliation. Um, I just guess had a question about the U.S. response. I know this is the premier screening, but because you were there um, with a le letter from the U.S. military, has there been any response from, have they seen the film? Has there been response to the film? Um, that was some pretty powerful, uh, powerful interview you had with that naval commander. And I was just wondering if there was response to the way that was filmed. Jeremy? Yeah, no, we spoke with uh, the Navy in uh, Bahrain and the you know, naval contacts here at the Pentagon afterwards because, you know, we were curious as well what they would think about the film. And honestly, I, we were a bit surprised, but they really liked it a lot. They thought, um, for their purposes, they thought it really illustrated the significance of the U.S. military presence there, that for global energy markets and for global economy, that they're contributing a great deal of stability. And the uh, people who worked at the Fifth Fleet thought it was very factual and accurate and straightforward and, you know, wasn't messing around. And they actually really liked it a lot. I think we were a bit surprised ourselves. I think one thing to add on that and I'll let you speak on it as well, um, is just how overblown this Iranian threat has been in the Bahraini context. Um, as far as I'm aware, and I've been really following this closely, there, there is not a link between uh, Tehran and the protesters in Pearl Roundabout or in any of the, the movements in Bahrain. Uh, and, and frankly, the Iranian security threat, while we can discuss it, it's not, it doesn't even come close to the level of uh, what the American Navy has there. We have um, over 30,000 sailors in sea. We have two aircraft carriers. That's about the size of the Iranian Navy the entire Navy. Uh, so when you're totally framing stuff as um, Iran, US, new Cold War, what have you, it doesn't really capture what the actual security interest is in this context. But Shauna, do you want to 
discuss? Yeah, I mean, just in, in terms of the, the film, if I had one small critique, it would be that it actually almost downplays um, the nature, the ferocious nature of the crackdown. Um, you know, uh, while we were there and in an ongoing basis, we speak to people in Bahrain um, every single day via email and phone. There, are, there were Facebook uh, pages set up that showed pictures of people participating in demonstrations in Pearl Roundabout with circles around their faces, uh, with um, words that said things like, who is this traitor, identify this traitor, and other people coming in to the page and saying, I know her, she's a school teacher at this and that place, she's the biggest traitor of all, her and her whole family went to Pearl Roundabout. There were hundreds of photos like this, Bahrain television also, um, you know, state state uh, owned television. In fact, did the same thing, showed pictures of trade unionists with circles around their faces, saying this is a big traitor, part of a Iranian conspiracy to bring down the economy through a general strike and overthrow the monarchy. Um, and so the nature of these attacks. While I was there, the uh, there were massive posters throughout the city that had pictures of nooses that said uh, there will be no amnesty. There were pictures of accused before even the trial of the major political and human rights leaders that, that happened. Pictures and of them. And we should note a lot of the trials were military tribunals. They weren't mm -hmm. following the. Pictures of their faces around um, the country with similar language. There will be no, um, that retribution is demanded. There will be no amnesty. This creates a climate of of intense, immense fear in workplaces, in fact, uh, where there were workers who participated, and that's every workplace, given the nature of how, how large the, the, the pro-democracy movement was and, and the how demonstrations small were. Is. Yeah, there were groups of pro-government workers who developed lists of co-workers with their names and their cell phone numbers and pictures of them and evidence of how they were traitors connected to the Iranian conspiracy, um, and their evidence would be he or she had pictures of the demonstrations on their computer. It's this sort of thing that we, um, we, we collected from workers. The, the nature of the, um, the pro-government retaliation against the protesters was very deep. And the response of the um, employers in the country to fire many, uh, over 2,500 uh, public and private sector workers with the excuse of having participated in these demonstrations and that number, when you look at an average Bahraini family of being approximately six people, we're talking about 12,000 individuals that are living without um, a primary income. And many of these dismissals took place in April and May. How many middle class people in this room can go that long without a paycheck? How long could you go and what would you do? We now have workers collecting money for their, their co-workers who were fired to help them eat from day to day. This is ongoing, and this is, this is Bahrain today. It, it's, so I, if anything, I feel that the, the mm -hmm. film may have sort of even downplayed mm -hmm. the deep, intense moment in May in the country and what was going on and what continues to go on today. Yeah. I, I think on the topic of Iranian involvement, I mean, I, I really don't know the extent of, of their involvement on the ground uh, in Bahrain and, and their uh, connections with uh, that movement. I mean, I would say that U.S. government, senior government officials told us that they were very confident that Iran had absolutely nothing to do with uh, the movement when it began, but they do feel like Iran definitely could take advantage of that situation. And other senior diplomats said that there's not a single U.S. foreign policy decision that's made in that region without considering the implications on Iran. And that's the lens through which a lot of our uh, foreign policy, especially in that region, is seen. And I think without a doubt, the, the situation in Bahrain really is sort of a, a seen as a proxy battle where you, know, you do have the U.S. And, the, and Saudi Arabia, who is the closest ally to the U.S. in that region on one side and Iran on the other. And I, you know, I think it's almost gotten beyond um, the, the actual involvement at the ground level because these much larger forces that are at play um, certainly see this as a, as a very significant battle. Mm. Just, I'll just add one point. Just on the, the, our characterization of the protests and like our discussion of that within the film, this really was a film about the U.S. and U.S. policy. 
Um, I urge you to watch the film that we've just released on the, uh, from, from the perspective of telling the story of the revolution. That wasn't what we were trying to do. We were really focused on what the US is doing here, what, why the US is making the decisions it's making, um, and what, what are the reasons behind that. So um, it, it's, it, we, we didn't spend as much time as the, the film that's just come out discussing the, the, the facts of what happened. Um, we, we, we really wanted to keep this strongly linked to what the White House uh, decision-making process is and what is the Obama administration's take and response to the Arab Spring. And it's, I think it's incredibly important that, uh, that the film ends with that image of Barack Obama talking about Bahrain. Uh, that May 19th speech is the first time President Obama, you can look up on Washington Post, they have a thing of all of his speeches, the first time he ever mentions Bahrain. And it's in the context of saying, look, and he always says, look, if you notice, look, uh, we can't have a dialogue with the opposition while the main leaders are in jail. And what we're seeing is this week, two uh, members of parliament were released, but a lot of major opposition figures are still not being given fair trials. And I would say among them are the two top uh, elected representatives of the Bahrain Teachers Association and the, the Bahrain Nurses Society, who were not among the 100 approximately 100 um, civil society activists who were released in the last few days. So let's take another question. Let's go in the back here. Gentleman right there. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Faraz Sani, and I'm the Iran Bahrain researcher for Human Rights Watch. Um, I had a quick question about US policy um, uh, since this documentary was focused on it. Um, there were, in, in, the, in the local press in particular, uh, much of it which is either very pro-government or controlled by the government. Lots of criticism of uh, the United States, particularly uh, the embassy uh, in Mename, and the relationship that the embassy had with the opposition movement, particularly with Al-Wafaq, which is the largest Shia opposition group. And I'm wondering if um, you looked into this at all, and I'm wondering to what extent this was, uh, you got a sense that this was a serious issue, that a lot of uh, Salafi groups and also Sunnis and pro-government supporters are now kind of creating a narrative that the United States is in part part of the problem for the protests actually starting up because they started to give too much uh, credence to the opposition movement and they actually started to openly support the opposition movement. Is that something that you looked into at all? Well, we tried to speak to um, the US Embassy officials when we were there. There was actually a delegation um, sort of top-level delegation. Deputy was, Secretary of State was there when we were there. And Jeffrey Feldman, I was think, there as well. well. Yeah. So uh, we, I mean, they were there <coughs> while we were there. And we got a press release um, on our email as we were driving around Manama saying that there were these two very high-profile officials in country um, discussing the Bahrain situation. So we went to the embassy and, you know, we figured we were the only journalists there, so they must want to speak with us, you know? <laughs> and there was a press release, too. But, but we, we weren't able to speak with anybody from um, the US Embassy um, on the ground. So it, it kind of limits you um, in what you can do. So we didn't, we, 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 we didn't look into that aspect. So I'm aware of the reports that you're talking about. I think that the, um, there was that um, story about the US Human Embassy, rights worker human for rights. the State Department. Uh, yeah, Ludovic Hood, I believe. Right. right. Uh, the State Department had to, had to uh, recall him back to the United States uh, because he had been working uh, with some of the opposition members and uh, there had been anti-Semitic comments made about him online and in online forums. Uh, he was accused of buying boxes of donuts for the uh, protesters and uh, the United States had to withdraw him uh, from Bahrain because of some of the comments that were made. Um, yeah, I mean, we had about three, four days in country, and it was pretty difficult to film. So there was a limit to what we could actually go around and investigate. We, we, uh, our, our focus was what you saw in the film, and um, so we, we didn't get the chance to look into aspects like that. No. Do you want to comment on that, Shana? Or should, should yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think when we were in Bahrain, um, activists um, in the human rights community and the labor rights community were asking um, us to come back to the United States and um, speak with uh, representatives of the US government on their behalf and ask this question, uh, basically, which side are you on? And um, are, are you on the side of our movement or not? And if you are, what can you do? Because the reality is, um, everyone we talked to, while they had these critiques of US policy, they also looked to the US with a lot of hope. 
with the idea that the U.S. does um, represent um, an, an ideal, and an ideal that, that has to do with democracy and human rights. And if that's the case, um, the opposition movement, the human rights movement, the labor rights movement, thinks that the U.S. should be on their side. And so they really um, were looking to the U.S. Open, in an open-minded way, despite it all, mm that the U.S. would, in fact, come down on their side. Mm. That's what we found as well. I mean, they really did consider themselves part of this regional um, kind of Arab Spring movement that, that they, they, they'd heard, you know, the words of Barack Obama about other countries in the region, especially places like Libya. People were, were mentioning that to us uh, often as we went around and spoke to people in the protest movement. They, 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 they just didn't understand why um, they were being um, given a very different uh, treatment um, in terms of the U.S. policy response. On the it's, it's what I like to call a gulf between the interests and values of the U.S. So we still haven't figured it out. So let's let's take another question and then we'll sort of pile some together. Right here, please. Hi, hey, uh, somebody. Uh, my name is Elisa Martinez I, from the National Front Trade Council. Um, somebody uh, mentioned that there is this contract. Uh, until 2016, mm. in some in some way, what do you think will be uh, the the alternative or the real leverage that United States can have in order to um, give a right incentive to 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 the monarchy to to reach this constitutional uh, approach or something that it's a little bit in between? Because if not, this uh, looks like it will be a a really tough uh, scenario until 2016. So, is there something that you see some ray of light uh, that being there you you see like the real incentive that the United States can can bring to to the region? Some leverage. Right. Well, I would argue, um, and this this isn't something everyone's going to agree with, that uh, that Manama, that the Khalifa family in Bahrain, the ruling family, um, needs the base more than we do to some extent that we give them this not only an Arab legitimacy, uh, security umbrella, protection from this uh, hyped up Iranian threat, but really just a, a ticket to the global marketplace. How did they get the free trade agreement? How did they get sort of this privileged stance is in part because of the base, I would argue, uh, which is a leftover of British imperialism, to be frank. The, the British Navy has been there for, a, uh, pardon me, a century. So it, it's almost as if we were grandfathered into this space. So in my opinion, if the, um, and then I, I want to hear what Shauna and Seb and uh, Jeremy have to say on this, but um, in, in my opinion, if we were to actually say, look, the threats that we're facing in the, in the Strait of Hormuz has to do with oil shipping lanes, this is an international problem. This isn't about the US being a global policeman. It's about working with, uh, I believe there's a French naval base uh, in Qatar or Kuwait. It's uh, bringing in you know, regional and international stakeholders. Uh, in a new Middle East, the US has to rethink its hegemonic role in the Gulf and whether this is actually going to work. But uh, Shauna, do you want to add to that? I, mean, I think there's an, a really the interesting story um, when you look at um, American involvement in this crisis in Bahrain of a, a changing, uh, a progression over time in policy. Um, in some ways that mirrors the, the changing over time of U.S. policy towards many of the protest movements in the region. And it has everything to do with the human rights community in the United States um, uh, advocating very strongly with the U.S. government on behalf of human rights in Bahrain um, with the members of, of Congress um, directly with the State Department. And that's um, been, I think, fairly effective. The Bahraini uh, community in the United States um, is also uh, very strong advocates for human rights in their home country and has been very active in keeping the story alive in the United States and has in fact um, supported hearings on the Hill about human rights in the country. And I think you know, the role of um, civil society in the United States in keeping human rights on the agenda is there in Bahrain and I think we see some um, real fruits of that. Um, and um, you know, I, I think that the danger now in the next phase is everyone collectively losing momentum. Uh, we've had a national dialogue, things are quieter. We know that they're not quiet. We know that there's nighttime raids still in the villages. We know that there's ongoing dismissals, firings of workers, but it's a much lower key. 
it's quieter. And there's a risk moving forward that the human rights community globally and in the United States lose some momentum around it. Um, and so in that regard, I think your, your film is really important. And um, you know, New America Foundation, I mean, you're to be commended for bringing this back up again. Thanks. Well, we had a ton of hands. Let's, um, let's take three questions, because we're sort of going short on time. Um, let's start in the back, this uh, gentleman over here. And move to the right, if you could, Dan. Thanks. Let's, yeah, let's grab. Go ahead. OK, um, my name is Benjamin Douglas. Um, I have a question for um, Ms. Blau. actually. You were talking about how trade unions were only allowed about a decade ago. Um, I was wondering, what were the forces pushing for that allowance? And um, what role did outside pressure play? And uh, how have those forces changed between then and the beginning of the uprising? Um, Let's just take the other two other questions. Is there someone on the, OK, this woman. Dan? Oh, after, you'll get the next one. Let's take, go ahead, pardon me. Uh, hi, my name's Michelle. I'm an intern at Brookings. Um, I just had a question about the religious leaders um, in Bahrain, if you'd spoken to them at all, if they said anything, did they have any concrete statements to make in regards to the Shi versus, Shia versus Sunni um, uh, appearance of this conflict, and if they were doing anything to either counter that or to corroborate that? Great, and then this woman in the center here. Hi, my name is Mariam Fadel. I'm uh, working uh, for Solidarity Center based in uh, Cairo. Uh, I'm just wondering, I, I have one comment on the, 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 the movie that um, it has no Arabic speaker people uh, show it at the, the movie. I don't know why. Um, I mean, it gives you like more dimension if you just you know, interviewed some people and then have subtitles uh, uh, translated into English. Um, I mean, this is conveyed the suffers or the, the the bad experience they they have gone through. Can I ask you for a question, though, please? Okay, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that, just why did we not have more Arabic? Yeah, okay, okay. great. So I um, have three questions, maybe one one for each of you. Do you want, shall we start with um, was the labor question first? Yeah, just, um, just really quickly, in fact, um, Bahrain had many decades prior to the legalization of the trade unions of, um, uh, of various forms of underground struggle. That there was a long period of time in Bahrain where many um, civil and political rights were repressed, um, including labor rights, and you had trade unionists operating underground or in exile, in, jailed, and the like. Um, the, uh, you know, the, there was a um, movement of national reconciliation that um, happened going back a decade or so ago um, that resulted in a national sort of charter um, that was talking about moving forward on political, uh, civil, and human rights in the country and um, created more um, sort of uh, dialogue among part, you know, partners within civil society. And the legalization of the labor unions was sort of part of that, that process. So I think it's a testament to their own um, struggle and vision of the labor movement that they were able to succeed. They also kept their story alive on the agenda by having um, contacts with parts of the UN system, such as the International Labor Organization, which played a major role in supporting the well, and One other thing is Bahrain is one of the first countries to run out of oil. So there's mm -hmm. big market questions of what do you do, how do you employ a, a population when there's not sort of the rentier economy. Mm -hmm. So do you want to talk about, um, did you speak to any religious leaders? Or do you want to talk about just sort of the general impression of what, what's it like to be in a mosque that's been destroyed by such clearly awful sectarian brutality? Well, I, I'd say on that point, we, again, just um, we didn't have any time at all to, in, in the country to go and speak to as many people as we would like. And also, this was a US policy-focused film, so this wasn't you know, the, the ultimate kind of story of what happened in Bahrain during the revolution. But um, in terms of the sectarian dynamic to this, um, a lot of the protests, um, the people in the movement that we spoke to wanted to really get away from that sectarian dynamic. They were saying that the protests um, were national um, in nature, that the crackdown was sectarian. They um, were very keen to get away from um, the, the characterization of this as a Sunni Shia um, kind of problem. Um, the, the mosques that, the, the, that we went around um, were mainly um, in those Shiite villages. So 
Um, this is, I mean, it's something that the pres President Obama also mentioned himself. He actually specifically referenced the destruction of Shia mosques in, in Bahrain. So I definitely think that is a big part of the problem. Um, but for the protest uh, movement members, they, they, they really want to try to get away from that characterization that this is a Sunni Shia dynamic um, and more that this is a question of kind of Bahraini national identity and people really asking for kind of um, economic equality and, and democracy rather than some, uh, some kind of sectarian um, uh, dynamic. Um, and so uh, just, sorry, just quickly on the Arabic speaker's point, um, the simple answer to your question is that um, there are many people in Bahrain who speak English. Uh, I mean, we, we, it's a very uh, high, I mean, many of the, most of the people that we met spoke English. It, it, it's an English language. Uh, film. So we, um, we, uh, instead of asking them to speak Arabic, we, we, we got them speaking English. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. Great. So um, we'll take two or three more questions. Gentlemen, uh, right in front of you, Dan. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, I'm Leon Weinschild, University of Wisconsin, Washington Semester of International Affairs. I'd like to refer to the r remarks from the gentleman from Human Rights Watch. It sounded like he made allusion to some facts which maybe didn't jibe with the narrative in your story uh, about the American embassy reaching out to other, other elements. You, you did say that you tried to reach these high-ranking officials at the embassy, but it seemed it would be a journalistic responsibility, in fact, to try to reach out to the elements in the local population. And it, it sounds like, and I'm not accusing you of bias, but it sounds like you say, well, that's not along the lines of the narrative we're trying to portray, so let's not, portray, let's not look for that too deeply. We attempted to reach the Americans. That was impossible. End of story. Okay. Why didn't you seek others? Great. Thanks. Um, let's go, gentlemen, all the way in the back. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Brian Dooley. I'm from Human Rights First. Uh, I've been doing some work on Bahrain. I was there in May. I was there again in July. I got back a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I've, well, okay, I'll stick to the point about the Iranian connection. Um, when I am asked about the Iranian connection, uh, the questions I'm asked by US officials are very much like uh, the mindset, in fact, the vocabulary of work I was doing 26 years ago um, when I was working with Senator Ted Kennedy on anti-apartheid legislation. Um, are the pro-democracy people secretly in league with the Soviets? Uh, is Desmond Tutu a puppet of the Kremlin? This guy Mandela must have done something if he's in prison. Uh, it's the same vocabulary, the same mindset around the pro-democracy movement in Bahrain now. <coughs> and uh, it was nonsense then, uh, and it's nonsense now. Yeah, I, th I think it, the, the foreign body, the foreign, um, countries that see this as a proxy war, uh, see it as having that potential. I mean, obviously, the, the people that we talked with um, denied any sort of connection with Iran, any sort of uh, funding from Iran, any interest in uh, achieving goals for Iran. Um, but I think the way that the situation has been framed by the international actors who are involved, um, it just makes that issue still still be there. They, they see it through that lens. I mean, that's the way that they're approaching it. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, um, but I, I think that's why it's, it's sort of part of the story and, and something that we feel like we, we still have to address to some extent. I mean, frankly, I, we, we asked uh, for specific evidence of Iranian involvement from some of the officials that we spoke to, uh, and we were never provided with any, actually. So. Um, I, I could, first, yeah, yes, I, I'm not quite sure exactly what um, you're, you're getting at with the question, but I mean, just to put it in perspective, how we filmed this section in Bahrain, we're invited in to go on an embed with the US military. We have um, only enough time in the country in order to do that. Um, we want to get those pictures out of the country um, without any problems with, if we get taken into custody and people take our material. Um, then we've, we've, we've lost everything that we came to Bahrain for. So we essentially had one afternoon free in Bahrain to go around, and you saw the sequence that we shot there, um, to go around and try and speak to people in the protest movement. We, um, we, 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 we had you know, an extremely difficult time filming on the ground. We weren't supposed to be filming anything apart from our embed on the US 
uh, USS Ronald Reagan. Those are not the circumstances in which you can go and do investigation into aspects of how much the US Embassy is funding um, opposition members or things of that nature. We, we, we had a very short window of opportunity to get the material that we needed to make the film that we were trying to make, um, and we did that. We, we, we weren't at liberty to kind of go around and explore every dimension to this we, we very, actually, very complicated. We did go to the US Embassy, though, and uh, it was when we saw that the Deputy Secretary of State uh, and Ambassador Feltman, who we interviewed, were in the country. And we showed up there and we called the, the person who was our contact there. And uh, she came down and she was in a state of shock. And she's like, what are you doing here? And we're like, well, you know, we're here on the ground. We thought maybe we'd be able to do an interview. And she's like, no one just stops by the embassy, okay? <laughs> and we're like, well, we're sorry. You know, we're journalists. We're really interested in getting the interview. So. That, that didn't work out. I mean, I was really happy that we were able to speak with Ambassador Feltman about it because he is a really high-ranking official. Um, but did you feel like there were perspectives, American perspectives, that weren't represented in the piece? Well, it was just that I don't know uh, how serious or deep are the, the uh, points that, that the fellow from Human Rights, made, uh, Human Rights right. Watch made about, in fact, the embassy was reaching out to other elements of Bahraini society so the, the, the individual who he's talking about works for the Human Rights Department of the U.S. Department of State. And he was there doing his own investigation into the human rights abuses that were taking place. Uh, and my understanding is that he was painted uh, by the, the ruling family as someone who was um, getting in with the protesters and siding with the protesters. This was actually after we had left, I think it was uh, in last month, uh, and the U.S. Embassy sort of had to uh, withdraw him as a result. Um, but that was a, a, a separate circumstance to, to sort of what our reporting experience was there. Well, I think our time's up, but I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for coming to New America Foundation today, for watching this important film, for updates on Bahrain, uh, the Arab Awakening, other developments across the region. Check out the Middle East channel, which is mideast.foreignpolicy.com. I'm assistant editor there. We have new content every day. Uh, asking tough questions, not just about the U.S. role, but what next for, uh, for the region after this time of change. So thanks so much, Shauna, Jeremy, Seb. Um, look forward to your next film. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming, everyone.